The fact that non-psychiatric patients get it is so important. Get all of this, and then animals get it. Now, here is a textbook. I'll show you it. It's a little book. It's out of the heart of the establishment. It's from something called the Psychiatric Clinics of North America. It's uh, very prestigious to get a big article in it. This one's 300 pages. It's actually a, uh, you know, a little booklet that's put out. And it appears first as a journal and then as a hardcover. Now, this is not written by psychiatrists. It's written by people who actually have to face some of this stuff. It's written by an emergency room doctor and a neurologist. And every group of psychiatric drugs is discussed in this as a neurotoxin. I can assure you it isn't assigned in medical school because they see the neurotoxic effects. They've got to figure it all out. N neurotoxic medications tend to have extremes that people will go to uh, often within the, the regular dosage because there's such a variation in human beings. So one of the ways to find out if something is a neurotoxin is to see what does it do in a crisis. Um, all the psychiatric drugs basically produce neurotoxic crises. I don't deal with amphetamines that we give to children, methylphenidate, so I'll mention that. Every amphetamine full prescribing information says that even at normal or low doses, patients can get a stimulant crisis on these drugs and they can be lethal, and the heart rate goes up, and you sweat, and you get uh, hyperactive, and your neurological reflexes start jumping, and your brain gets over-jazzed, and, and in death. And they are clear. They say in all of them that it can be on normal doses. That's the amphetamine extreme neurotoxicity uh, position. So. And remember this other thing. By the way, you now know more truth about psychiatric drugs than any psychiatrist you're ever likely to meet. What do you think of that? They don't hear the basics because the basics are devastating and some of the basics I'm going to get to would actually put them on trial, the whole profession in many ways, for what it's done in the past and, and today and in the future. My profession that I so lovingly wanted to be a part of, and am. So remember I told you that when you do damage, the outcomes are pretty much the same. So a lot of the drugs have warnings like this. And this, in the book I just showed you, is a section on neurotoxic medication crises. And, and they actually make it a general observation. And if you go and look up any one of the psychiatric drugs, probably in overdose at least, some of them may not, some of the weaker ones, but all the major classes, if you go and look, you're going to find some of this, that, in, that, in, that, that typical of neurotoxic medication crises in general, in particular for psychi psychiatric drugs. Like any potent neurotoxin, actually, this is not out of the book. I might be confused. Nope, this is me. I'll get to the book, and, or if I haven't got it, I'll look it up. Any psychiatric drugs cause extreme neurotoxic crises. They can be lethal and so on and so forth. So let me see what I got next. The serotonin syndrome is the acute neurotoxic crisis that you can get from any drug that's jacking up serotonin, which is most of the um, antidepressants, but not just the so-called SSRIs that are in the Paxil, Selexa, Lexapro class, but uh, Wellbutrin and other, other drugs that have stimulating profiles. And this is... This is um, from the label, the full prescribing information. Serotonin syndromes may include mental status changes, e.g. agitation, hallucinations, delirium, and coma, 
autonomic instability, <coughs> tachycardia, that's uh, fast heart rate, labile blood pressure, uh, dizziness, diaphoresis or sweating, flushing, hyperthermia, fever, neuromuscular sy symptoms, tremor, rigidity, myoclonus, which is a body twitching, hyperreflexia, incoordination, seizures, and or, because now we go, serotonin's in your gut, serotonin's in your bloodstream. So you get sick there from the toxin. So after seizures, gastrointestinal systems, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, patients should be monitored for the emergence of serotonin syndrome. I've been in cases in which there were flagrant, almost deaths from serotonin syndrome where the doctors didn't want to admit it. Maybe one consult said it, and then the record pays no attention. And the patient almost dies. In my cases, my legal cases, uh, most of them have been almost dies. Once you die, uh, your relatives have to bring the suit, and they usually don't know, have any idea what's going on. Now, a concept I developed, you'll find the, my papers on 123antidepressants.com and other places on my website, that psychiatric drugs ha uh, hide their harmful effects. Well, this is obvious. I'm the first person to ever talk about this as a concept. Yet everybody knows that this is what neurotoxic drugs do. People who take marijuana, have you ever gone to a party where somebody's smoking dope and you're not? You know, the, the, they are not saying profound things. And the jokes are not funny. It takes a little brain damage to laugh at them and the cookies probably don't taste very good either. And you go to a party where the alcoholic who's intoxicated, it's another kind of intoxication, it's all about brain poisoning, it, it can come from many sources, the intoxicated person thinks he's the life of the party and people are actually leaving. I once obeyed these ads that say drunk friends don't let drunk friends drive, you know. And I, I being that I love the world, I expanded that concept. So I was walking along with a friend of mine who's a diminutive woman, but strong, good friend, lawyer. And we see this woman who is trying to get her car keys in the door, she's so drunk, she'd just come out of the bar, it was very near my home, which gave me a, an unrealistic feeling of security. Um, and she can't get the keys in, she's dropping them, so we both walk up, and we are not frightening looking people. I mean, I'm, I never wear a suit ever, except in court or giving my first speech to a new audience. And um, we go up and we say, you know, we're not sure you can drive. Uh, do you have any friends? And all of a sudden, her five drunk male friends showed up and wanted to beat the daylights out of us. All right, so we know that drinking impairs the frontal lobes, marijuana impairs the frontal lobes, makes people unable to judge. Cocaine does it. This is why, even smoking to some extent, this is why people can go, oh, and even I think caffeine to some extent, can impair your appreciation of what, what the drug may be doing to you but grossly with these much more potent drugs than, than, than nicotine and caffeine. And so people don't know what's happening to them, and that's why your loved one is walking around like this and, and is unable to function on her antipsychotic drugs, and she doesn't understand it. Her frontal lobes have been injured. That's what allows all this to go on, and it's why some of us get addicted and don't know what's happening to us, and it has to be our wives or children who say, Mom, Mom, you're, you're addicted. The doctor's drugs, if they're smart, have addicted you, the benzos or the stimulants, because we're always the last to know. And I've had the experience myself. Um, I struggle with a lot of allergies, as you know, from my little introduction, and I used to take Benadryl sometimes. I would get up in the morning after taking a Benadryl the night before, and I would be grumpy with my wife, whom I love with all my heart. And she'd say, honey, you're being grumpy. I'd say, no, I'm not. You're blah, 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 you know? She'd say, oh, God, you took that, you took that darn thing last night again. That anti, not an anti, antihistamine, which, by the way, the antipsychotics are derived from antihistamine. So I may get a chance to tell you that story. So I would get grumpy at my wife and not blame myself psychologically 
for being grumpy, which a man should do when he's grumpy at his wife. He should own it and apologize and try to be loving and work things out. The wife should do the same thing. And I did, never entered my mind it was the Benadryl. And I tried it once more because I don't, you know, I don't want to let Ginger tell me what to do. So I got, I, I, I got a little agitated and grumpy again. Um, again, I've already talked about this, that you discover a psychiatric drug by finding its neurotoxic effects on animals. Oh, I love the asides. Eli Lilly published a paper years before they um, applied for the Prozac and went through the experimentation. And they weren't thinking ahead. These, you know, some of these researchers, they just want to publish. They weren't thinking ahead. And they published an article, and you'll find it under the animal section um, in, uh, in 1, 2, 3 antidepressants. And they say, as a one or two paragraphs, uh, our cats who've been through many experiments and were easy to handle and, you know, really liked us, on this drug became very irritable and unmanageable. They got angry. They hissed. And, they say, and it lasted sometimes for a period after the drug was withdrawn. Well, that should have told them right away. People are going to get violent on this, very likely. They hid it. I found it. As a part of that you know, huge work I was doing. Well, now we get into the, the really tough stuff. I'm very dry. Um, let me drink a little water. Does my voice sound okay? Good. I apologize if I st start wiping my dry lips. I'm going to tell you about these neuroleptic drugs, which are the model for all psychiatric drugs. And since most psychiatric drugs affect dopamine, most psychiatric drugs have some resemblance to, these, to the neurotoxins like Abilify and Seroquel. And, and so on, all the newer ones. Okay, we go back to 1952, and a surgeon named um, Labrie in Paris is looking for something that will help patients hibernate, slow them down, so that their bodies won't be so prone to uh, shock after surgery. He's got theories, this guy's got theories galore, and he also has a lot of psychological theories. So he gives Thorazine at the time, which had a number rather than a name, and which is still used in psychiatry. You've heard of Thorazine. It's, it's the basic model. It's still given in emergency rooms. It's uh, still used in a lot of different ways. Um, and the next one to come along way back was Haldol. You've probably more of you heard of that. It's given to a lot of people in acute trauma centers, acute ICUs. And, um, acute care units, and, and it's given to anybody who's out of control, often in a, uh, an emergency room, although now the just as bad drugs are being used. So what, delay, what, what um, Labrie found was that his patients still suffered pain, but didn't care anymore. Didn't do anything for hibernation, but he noticed they became indifferent and uncaring. And he, the word in French reads really nicely about indifference or something. Law indifference. I can't possibly pronounce it. But that's what they knew. They knew right away. This is, this is going to cause indifference in patients. So they ran out. So he, he actually, I think he ran. I think he ran a new record in a 100-yard dash and went down to his neighbors. I can't prove that. Uh, who, who were Delay and Deniker working in the hospital psychiatric section in Paris. And they immediately began giving the drug to patients. And they immediately said, we knew we had a really great drug because we listened to the nurses, and the nurses were really happy with this drug. They didn't tell you exactly why they were happy, but that's what they said. Um, they then went ahead and began pushing this drug so that within a year and a half, two years, every mental patient in every state mental hospital in the world was on one of the, was on Thorazine or the ones that came right after, like Haldol. There's no serious testing. 
Meanwhile, they were seeing a lot of odd things and reporting them. A guy named Hollister wrote an article for JAMA saying there are a lot of neurotoxic effects from this drug. This is the first big psychiatric drug. They didn't know what they had. Up to then, they'd been lobotomizing people, shocking people, giving them arsenic, purging them, making them vomit. All these wonderful things we've done in our state mental hospitals. But now they had a drug and they felt so good. They even said this. They felt like doctors. They had a drug. This is the beginning. This is the great revolution of this drug. So they began to notice that these patients, almost all of them women, got hysterical symptoms, this is probably yeah, it's just women, they would twitch, they'd grimace. They actually noticed this. Hollister actually wrote all about it and said, I think this is neurotoxic. Nobody paid any attention because they were women, and most of them old. I was walking with my mother-in-law one day, and uh, we were joking about my, my leading her to the bathroom, one old guy re leading the slightly older lady <laughs> to the bathroom. And there's a 15-year difference between me and Ginger, and a 10-year difference between me and mom. And I said, and, and mom said, you know, I mean, what are people going to think, you know, about your leading me to the bathroom? I said, honey, they don't, people don't notice anything but themselves mostly. And she said, and old people, we're invisible. All right. Sorry. Old women, especially, are invisible. So then, They've published all their papers, there's a few, they're all, the big conferences, there's been maybe two talking about neurotoxicity, and they get a phone call, maybe, they don't tell us what the communication was from the drug company. They had given one of their drugs in this class, which is Compazine, which is still used for nausea, be careful, don't ever take Compazine for nausea, there are better drugs than that. Uh, all these drugs stop block the nausea center because it's dopamine control. So they get, a phone, they get this communication. They've given it to soldiers to stop their nausea when they are on boats. And even in that short period of time, they're seeing these dramatic arrays of grimacing and spasming and distortions and leg movements and just all these strange arrays. And they don't even have uteruses. And they totally changed their attitude. Overnight, in a moment, they realized they had to face this. Can you imagine? I mean, what, you know, what an indictment of men, of professions, and so on and so forth. And, systems and drug companies. So it dawns on one of them, I think Deneker, because he's very proud of it. He says, I've seen this. One of them says, I've seen this. We've seen all of this in an epidemic that killed a lot of people, afflicted millions toward the end of the flu in World War I and into the 20s, there were big conferences about it because just like the antipsychotic drugs in what is called tardive dyskinesia, just like them, they produced every known motor abnormality. So neurologists wrote books, I read them. They wrote, they had conferences all about this array of abnormalities and the indifference that goes with it. And they thought, this sounds just like the drug. So he ran back and he looked and he came back and he wrote. He wrote. There's no way to tell the difference between the effects of the drug and the effects of lethargic encephalitis. Now, if you realized that and you were a person of conscience, what would you do? What do you think they did? They called the company and said, this is amazing. Give us your worst drug. They didn't say it that way. Give us the drug that's causing the most neurological abnormalities in your monkeys. And they got it and they tortured women patients, taking them through the stages with increasing doses. They published it. This is on my website, too, under Deneker and Delay's publications. Tortured them, published it, and commented on the similarity to lethargic encephalitis, and wasn't this amazing and wonderful, basically. They put in, but we don't think it'll be permanent. Well, everything in lethargic encephalitis was permanent, and it's all permanent. It all can be permanent. Tardive dyskinesia, 
afflicts normal people like you in the audience who are physically normal, you get the drugs for one reason or another, five to eight percent of people cumulative per year. At three years, you've got 15 to 24 percent chance of getting all or some of the array of lethargic encephalitis. Now, good old Deniker, by the way, he wrote his heart out. Nobody paid much attention, and the profession didn't want to hear this, but he wrote his heart out and they had to publish him. He's a great hero. He just kept writing about all this. Finally, he admitted that it was permanent. You couldn't tell the difference. And at one point, he wrote, we could have we could have thought in the beginning, he doesn't tell us whether they did, we could have thought in the beginning that we could have created an epidemic of lethargic encephalitis with these drugs, and now we know we did. And then toward the end he said, we know these drugs have their drawbacks, he said, but I'm so proud of this connection between lethargic encephalitis and um, the drugs. Is that mind-blowing? Um, I don't know what I did with my clipper, flipper. I can never name that thing that we use, the remote. It's like a remote. Um, well, Cade discovers lithium. He discovered lithium. Oh, we're still there. Are we at Cade? Where, is that where we've been? All right. Yeah, that's where so I was on. So Cade discovered lithium. I can do that quick. He was working in his lab near the hospital. He was interested in renal function for some reason. He injected gu guinea pigs in their belly with lithium and made them all flake out. So he too broke the 100 yard dash record, raced across the street and started giving them the mental patients and he calmed down all the people who couldn't be otherwise calmed down. And this was way back before the neuroleptics. And nothing much came of it. But that was the beginning. And then eventually it was picked up and it became this uh, really big deal. And then NIMH went and claimed that it was a magic bullet for mania. Some magic bullet. It flakes out guinea pigs and everybody on the ward. So full of lies. Big advertising campaign. Big advertising campaign. Magic bullet. They forgot that there was an article in the American Journal of a medicine that lithium substitutes were killing people in the 1920s. So neurotoxic. Prozac I've told you more than you care to know about. So many studies confirm that psychiatric drugs do more harm than good. It is impossible to prove that any psychiatric drug is helpful long term. There are hundreds of studies about how damaging they are in the short term. They'll give you a euphoria, an apathy, or a sedation, and that's it. And um, since I've been doing this work so long, there's really two other folks, many others, but two who have written really good books about this. Peter Goetze, who is one of the most famous researchers in the world, and then he wrote a book called um, De uh, Deadly Psychiatry and Organized Denial. Good title. And now they're trying to throw him out of the institute he founded in Denmark, and they've already thrown him out of the worldwide organization he founded. I'm going to Denmark, stand up for him. We organized a conference. I'm going to be there in March. Anybody wants to come in March to meet Peter Gerritsen? Robert Whitaker, who's a journalist, has written a book called Anatomy of an Epidemic. Just so you can see other people are learning. Um, Whitaker, uh, a lot from me, went to my conferences, interviewed me before his first books. Goetze came to these conclusions just because he was a researcher for a very famous research net network, the Corcoran, and he started looking at psychiatry, and he, and he came to a lot of the same conclusions as me, and then he heard about me, and he had 20 books to read. I sent him five, and uh, we've become good friends. And Whitaker will be at the conference, Goetze will be at the conference. My books, Toxic Psychiatry, is still, still uh, really... Uh, good to read. It's the book that changed most professionals' minds. The main problem is I wasn't talking about the antidepressants much because it was 1991. Everything in it is about the treatments, the therapies, it's all basically there. Medication madness you can buy and you've already been told about my guilt, shame, and anxiety book and you've been told about um, my um, psychiatric drug withdrawal book.